can you see that okay. yeah yeah and are you able to see the screen now it's um, black screen github screen yeah yeah great, great. so um um hi everyone so before um i start uh today's session is going to be around accelerated deep learning right so um before i start a little bit of introduction regarding myself so i am currently working at intel um, and um, uh, and i'm a part of their um, ax3 supercomputing group which is related to um, developing kernel level codes for different kind of um, cards by cards i mean gpus cpus xpus fpgas and these kind of kernel level codes are generally used for either high performance computing or in many other cases uh, very large workloads by large workloads i mean um, imagine you are at a data center in nasa and you are trying to develop the image of the black hole so uh, the python script that which you which you will be using um, cannot be fit into one particular machine or one particular um, device. By device, I mean either any kind of CPUs, GPUs, or XPUs. So um, developing that kind of distributed, um, I would say, um, model uh, for you know performing different kind of machine learning or deep learning um, methods is very difficult on classical systems that we have. So my task is is actually my team's task along with me is is to build uh, certain softwares and kernels which helps people like that um, scale up faster so exascale computing um, and also something related to large neural models like there is always a competition between all semiconductor industries how they can well scale um, you know very large models let's say you know i'm sure many of you have heard of gpt or gpt3 uh, particularly a 175 billion parameter model. And uh, how we can scale that, by scaling I mean how we can perform inference faster, how we can uh, beat the benchmark. So whenever a language model or any kind of machine learning model gets created, uh, there is always a kind of a race between different uh, industries or different uh, organizations to beat the benchmark. So this benchmark effectively relies on a particular downstream task that a particular model, either vision model or NLP model or audio model has to break through, all right? And this can only be done if you have proper support from the internal hardware, uh, but particularly the, you know, the kernel level stuff. And um, that is what, you know, I work on. And um, I was interested on in keeping this session related to uh, deep learning because um, uh, it is an emerging topic and it is not a topic which is popularly seen in the mainstream. Um, so um, I'm sure many of you are in your bachelors, you are preparing for your placements and all, which is excellent. And um, you have good understanding of everything. Uh, but this is a field which is a little bit different and very sophisticated. And I just wanted to give you a sneak peek of how you can just do something in this field if you just want to. Uh, so uh, with that, I did not prepare any presentations. The reason being, I wanted to keep it a little bit of um, hands-on. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll be able to follow. So um, before that, I wanted to uh, give an outline of what we are going to cover today. So um, in terms of machine learning platforms, uh, there have been, um, you know, let me open my notepad. Yeah, just excuse me a second. Hope you can see the notepad, right? So it's a white screen. You can see the notepad. So, um, so when we come to ML platforms, uh, we have generally two popular platforms comes into our uh, into our mind, that is Torch and TensorFlow, right? And Torch and TensorFlow um, have been quite popularly used everywhere. And um, the code bases that I have written today or in the past few weeks since I got the notification are based on Torch, but these can be easily replicated in TensorFlow. Now, before we go ahead, um, 
I wanted to mention that both these deep learning libraries are extremely useful and they have their own drawbacks and own advantages. Um, so, so I'm sure, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have, you know, have used TensorFlow or how many of you have used, uh, you know, PyTorch. Uh, but when we are using TensorFlow and PyTorch, there is a fundamental difference, particularly when we go back to the later versions of TensorFlow, that is before two, the version two got released. So um, one of the major changes was that whenever we were writing a code for TensorFlow kernel, so let's say we are writing a standard ML code generally looks like this. So you are going to have a particular model. So this model can be any model that you want. So it can be a simple linear model, um, you know, feed forward neural network uh, that is in Keras or TensorFlow terms. Uh, it is just a simple dense layer combination. In Torch, it is also uh, torch.nn.linear. So um, if we can consider this simple model, now, whenever we are, we are training the model, for certain results. So let's say we are training a ba very basic ResNet model for um, for getting you know ResNet 50 for on a on a CIFAR or an image data dataset. Uh, we need to write a training loop, right? So we have to you know write a training loop. Now this is where it gets interesting. Uh, whenever we are writing a training loop, um, the way we write the loop actually is different for both TensorFlow and PyTorch. Now I'm not talking about the syntax. I'm talking about internally how they both perform. So uh, it is very important to remember. I'm going to highlight the uh, the parts which are similar to both of the platforms. Both of the platforms, as of now, currently support graph-based uh, computation. All right. So whenever you say any kind of tensor operations, let's say you want to do the derivatives, you want to find the Jacobians or the derivatives. So uh, I'm going to write it as derivatives. So you know, let's. Uh, so we write gradient tape for let's say for TensorFlow. We generally write gradient tape for TensorFlow, and within that scope, we generally uh, try to perform any kind of operations, math operations. So these operations can be addition, subtraction, uh, differentiation. Um, you know, uh, generally, which is related to computation of gradients or any formulation of gradients that we want. Now, uh, this computation always occurs. Uh, in, in the back end uh, as a graph. All right, so whenever you are doing these operations, these are all, you know, graph based. So you are going to have a node, uh, let's say over here, um, let me open paint, for example, it will be easier for me to say. Uh, let's say we have an operation which is like X plus Y. Simple operation, no derivatives and all, just a simple addition operation within the gradient tape in TensorFlow, let's say. So what will happen is that it, a graph will be created all right. So let's say you have one uh, tensor variable as X and one tensor variable as Y. And these two will be a nodes in the graph. And another important feature is that this graph is actually a symbolic graph. Symbolic graph means that you are going to have certain addition operations over here or any kind of operations. In majority of the cases in deep learning, uh, it's all MATML, like matrix multiplications or tensor multiplications. Majority of deep learning resides on MATML operations, all right? And uh, the competition is always there in how we can scale these MATML operations, okay? Like which hardware or which internal kernel combination can better scale this MATML um, very, very quickly, very efficiently across hardwares. So when we have this, this, this is a simple uh, kind of a graph. Now let's say we have ResNet 50 and we want to train that. So if we go, um, if, if we go like uh, in the inner graph part, you will be finding different kind of, um, you know, nodes. You will be having nodes for convolution. So let's say conf two D. You will have nodes for bash normalization, and these are just different layers in your neural network. So classically, when you write a neural network, you are going to, um, you know, which is there in this model that I highlighted. So you are going to have, you know. Uh, uh, you know, different layers. So let's say you are going to have a layer like, um, you know, uh, for instance, um, let's say a torch, let's say I'm writing in TensorFlow. So on 2D followed by, you name it, like let's say I want to do a batch normalization, batch norm, followed by another, you know, pooling, right? So 
these are just different layers in your in your neural network. So what happens inside the graph is that they get linked. All right. So after batch normalization, you are going to have cooling operation. Uh, you are going to have, you know, other layers like um, flatten, and then you are going to have a simple dense layer, right? So these are connected by a graph. Now, as the control flows down, right, certain operations are repeated. And these operations are, you know, um, generally in a machine learning model, whenever you pass in through a convolution kernel or a batch normalization kernel, um, some of these kernels have certain activations, like nonlinear activations. All right. So, and apart from these nonlinear activations, there are also certain, you know, matrix multiplications which are happening. The common part of these calculations are just embedded in a, another node. So let's say these are the common calculations of both of these batch normalization and, and convolution. This is the common part. So let's, let's say this common node has certain calculations or certain operations, which are both common in convolution and batch normalization. All right. So what will happen in this case? So instead of the byte stream passing directly from conf to bn, like after conf to bn, one at a time, it will, what it will do is it will take up first cache of the, you know, um, operations which are happening in both the layer, in both the nodes, common operations, and then it will try to, uh, you know, uh, perform the, uh, the operations which are exclusive to both the nodes. So let's say the operations over here are, for example, it is multiplication. So it will perform the multiplication first and whatever exclusivity is there, it will follow that in order. So exclusivity, first convolution, and then batch normalization. And this method is actually one of, uh, is there in the latest both Torch and TensorFlow. And this is actually a kind of thing which is known as fusion, fusion of operations. Okay. These are known as fusion of operations. And in other words, these are known as fused graphs, fused graph nodes. All right. So whenever you save a Torch or a TensorFlow uh, model, you will be having certain computations or certain operations which are fused. Fused means that they are, you know, um, that uh, let's say the compiler will just compile them one. So for TensorFlow, there is a compiler called as Grappler, which is used for graph computation internally. Um, so in that case, Grappler will check which are the fused nodes, right? The fused nodes tells you that my computation will enhance or my, uh, you know, the efficiency will increase. All right. Now this is all happening in the C++ backend. We just write the code, you know, in Python. Uh, it does whatever optimizations it has to do in the backend. All right. Now this is what um, you know the platform is similar. This is the similarity on both the platforms. Now in terms of the dissimilarity, I wanted to highlight something. In terms of the dissimilarity, uh, TensorFlow 1.0 did not have something called as an eager mode. Eager mode means, so let's say uh, whenever you are trying to run a TensorFlow code, it is always, um, you know, um, it was it was thought before 2.0 to always compile the code first, then you can run the code, just like a simple C program or a C++ program, right? Um, basically, all you know, Python, C, or C++. You compile the code, right, and then you just uh, run the code. But in the case of Torch, you have this dynamic kind of uh, runtime based uh, uh, compilation, which is uh, where you do not require additional compile time. So whatever training you want to do or whatever inference you want to do in Torch, it was previously supported in that way that the graph that, that you need only one traversal of that graph rather than compile the graph, check for the incorrect nodes, and then flag it in runtime. So here what happens in the case of Torch, uh, from previously it was, let's say from pre. Uh, by pre, I mean in the late, in the earlier versions as well, uh, it was it had already supported this eager mode that we call in TensorFlow. Eager mode means it is all of the errors that you are going to get that is in runtime, that is not in compile time. All right, this is the major. This was the major difference when it was one point back. Now there have been many other changes, and I do not want to get into all of the details. Uh, but um, both the platforms are great. You know, both the platforms have support for different hardwares. And um, I just want to mention something. Uh, most of the graphics drivers, so let's say NVIDIA, AMD, um, Intel, so all of these graphics drivers have their uh, suitable binaries for all of these Torch and TensorFlow uh, libraries. Okay. And um, 
um, you know, there have been competitions going on, like which can scale faster and so on and so forth. So this is uh, this was the idea behind uh, me taking this uh, you know this session is that to give you an understanding of why the two platforms are uh, are different and um, how they are you know being used currently. So Torch and TensorFlow are popularly being used everywhere, right? And today we are going to focus on Torch, particularly on the uh, C++ side of Torch, uh, because uh, for the Python side of Torch. Uh, you can readily get, uh, you know, on the on the documentation page, and you can, and you can just try out, you know, different blogs. And I wanted to give you a highlight so that you can understand what is happening whenever you run a training loop at the back. So in a C++ code. So um, before that, before I go into C++ code, I wanted to highlight um, some important things. So um, how many of you use a Linux system? So I use a Windows system, but how many of you use a Linux system? Uh, I'm not sure if I can see. So I see that it is echoing. So uh, am I audible now properly? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Great, great. So um, if you have, you know, if, if majority of you have a Linux system, uh, it's well and good. Otherwise, if you do not have it, you can also download it on Windows. You know, there are may many softwares which creates a virtual uh, Linux or Ubuntu kernel for you. Uh, I use uh, WSL for Windows. You know, it is good to use that or you can use Mobile Xterm. Uh, you know, if you want to, you know, just run an Ubuntu subsystem on. Uh, so I'm just writing the softwares, WSL or Mobile Xterm. Term. or there are other softwares as well like VNC where you can uh, just use create a Linux kernel and so on. Now, um, whenever so, let me just start. Uh, you know, telling uh, uh, what I wanted to show you is that whenever you are having a kind of uh, so, let me go to my home directory. All right, so just one second. Why can't I see? So, CD. So I am in a in a root kernel. So I have certain uh, I have a conda environment in my Ubuntu. So if you see my conda environment, it is a simple conda environment which I just created for this uh, for this uh, for this uh, you know for today. And it contains very simple um, dependencies. Um, so we have Torch, uh, because I wanted to focus on Torch today. Um, and I will be giving you certain resources which are equally important for TensorFlow at the end, uh, you know, if I get time, because I was not able to you know, write uh, you know, both for Torch and TensorFlow at the same time. So uh, yeah, so this is the dependencies which I have. Now, if you install Torch by default, you are going to have this library in build, MKL. Now, MKL stands for Math Kernel Library. Okay, so uh, it it gets installed uh, with 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 a basic Python installation. So you can do conda uh, conda forge or you can install it by conda install. Uh, but mention Python CPU like like Torch CPU, right? If you mention Torch CPU, the MK generally the MKL binaries get uh, loaded into into your uh, PyTorch binaries. So MKL is actually one of the uh, libraries by Intel, which actually speeds up your um, math computations, like particularly MathML operations in your CPU. It is very good for your CPU. And um, I think the latest Python, PyTorch has uh, MKL already in bed. Also, you can install uh, you know, CUDA versions as well if you want to have. So you, will, you are going to have MKL plus CUDA. And CUDA will be sophisticated for your only NVIDIA drivers. All right. So um, yeah. So now that we have you know this dependencies, you can just um, uh, you can just copy these. I'm not sure how to how to share uh, this particular list of dependencies, but you can just create them like you know, conda create. Um, you just write your name, whatever you want to ABCD, and you just list the, list the dependencies that you want to um, install. Let's say torch, 
uh, Torch Vision, um, PyCuda, you know, ONNX, whatever you want to install, right? And you just want to activate that environment, okay? Um, now, uh, I want to give you a list of what I have. Uh, yes, another thing you want to install is since you are going to use the uh, PyTorch version, like the C++ version, in, in case of PyTorch, we have something called as LibTorch. So let me just write it over here. C++ for Torch is known as LibTorch. And if I go to Google, LibTorch, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, this is the way how you can install it. I'm going to share it here so that you know everyone gets to see and the instructions are pretty much straightforward as it is there so you just w get this w get this means you are actually downloading the latest zip of liptorch now what is liptorch liptorch is actually um, the c++ backend on which pytorch runs and it is compatible with uh, I would say one DNN API. So one DNN API is is that API which supports MKL DNN, which supports uh, you know um, anything that is related to CPUs particularly. All right. So this um, you know C++ API at the LibTorch is actually um, uh, the backend of what you know PyTorch is running on. Okay. Now this LibTorch is very much required if you even if you want to do CUDA. So let's say you want to write CUDA code for PyTorch in C++, right? Uh, you will not generally get these kinds of, uh, you know, uh, codes uh, like CUDA for C++ in using PyTorch. Let's say you are writing a big transformer model. Okay, let's say you are writing GPT-3 in, in C++ uh, with NVIDIA backend and LibTorch. In that case, you, are, you generally will not be getting the code, so you have to write it yourself. So in that case, you have to just, uh, you know, uh, compile the binaries of both NVIDIA CUDA as well as, um, you know, LibTorch. So LibTorch is compatible with a lot of XPUs, all right? And you just unzip it, okay? Uh, you just unzip it. Um, so after you unzip, you are going to get something which is similar to over here. Uh, you know, let me just go to home. Yeah, let me just, it's over here. So you're going to have something like uh, LibTorch somewhere. It should be written uh, LibTorch, yeah. So you're you're going to, uh, you know, get over here. Now, let me tell you something that um, there are many, many optimization libraries available, many. So Torch itself has LibTorch, Torch CCL, uh, you know, Torch ONNX, Tor TensorRT Torch, which, which got recently released. And uh, so many other releases are there for different XPUs. Uh, but, you know, uh, I would suggest not be not to be, you know, worried about that. You know, LibTorch is one of the main things. Like, um, I would say, if you want to write C++ code for Torch, just go ahead with LibTorch. That's that's it. Um, if Yeah, if you want to do experimentation on other uh, XPUs, that's, that's completely different. So uh, once if you have that LibTorch installed, then... Uh, you extract it and you need to actually install this LibTorch. So uh, what happens is uh, in, in any case, let me just give you the idea. So in after you have unzipped the LibTorch, you need to have certain steps to write C++ code for PyTorch. So the first step is creating a CMake. CMake lists.txt file. All right. Now this is very important. What is CMake lists? CMake lists actually is... Uh, I would say a kind of, in Python, we have setup.py or requirements.txt. Any kind of pip installations that you do, go to the GitHub repositories of those, you will be finding either a requirements.txt or a setup.py. CMake lists.txt is a kind of a setup.py. Oh, what happened? I just, uh, sorry. Yeah, a setup.py for binding all C++ dependencies. Got it. So it is going to bind all C++ dependencies. So you are going to bind for Torch in this case and any other libraries that you want to bind for. So let's say 
uh, in our case, since we are go only going to use torch, we do not need anything else. But let's say if you are going to, you know, uh, if, if you require, let's say, uh, some dependencies, especially from CUDA. So let's say you need a dependency from Apex. So in Apex, you have to, you know, in your CMake, you have to install the C++ executable binaries for Apex. Okay, you have to mention it like that. And I will show you how to write a CMake. Don't worry. So this is just a setup for binding all the C++ dependencies, uh, it, which you require for running your deep learning model. All right. Now, once you have done that, now what to do? I'm just giving you the steps now, and then we're going to go into the implementation details. Once you have the CMake uh, lists, uh, you need to create, uh, also in the CMake list, you also need to specify other thing. Your app, your app, your app means your CPP script. Let's say example.cpp or in our case, let's say resnet.cpp. Okay. So you have to mention the name of your CPP script, which will include the build dependencies, um, you know, from C++. All right. Let's say for lip torch, Apex and so on. And once you do that, uh, the next step is to write your, write your resnet CPP or any kind of code, uh, you know, your, which you are writing. So once you have written your ResNet CVP, you have to compile. Next is the compilation stage, right? So the compilation, you have two, two commands for PyTorch. They have actually simplified the process than before. And these compilation commands are, I guess, um, let me just see. Uh, just one second, I had written it somewhere. Oh, OK, it, it is already there in the, in, in the over here. Um, you do not have to do all these things, example app. No, no, no need to do all these things. You just need these two commands. All right. So these, they have highly simplified the process. Before it was not like that. Uh, now it was, now it has become, you know, quite easy. To build. For TensorFlow, uh, I will be updating the repo with more codes in the time being. I could not complete, uh, you know, some part of the code. Uh, but yeah, I will be updating it in the time being. Uh, it will contain both TensorFlow, Torch, ONNX, and different other optimizations. Um, yeah, so you need these two commands. So this command is compilation. This command is for build. Build means you are going to build the binaries, right? You are going to build the binaries. Uh, so just an out of you know out of context question. So uh, how many of you have done pip install TensorFlow as opposed to installation of TensorFlow from source or installation of PyTorch from source? So uh, oh, I, I think I cannot see uh, the people. So I, I generally I generally I keep it interactive so that I know that I'm you know. Uh, but I'm sure that this is uh, this is a broadcast, so I think I cannot uh, answer. Uh, fine, no worries. So whenever you try to install any kind of deep learning platform from source, you need to install certain dependencies. Generally, uh, and also I will give you some ideas. So let's say you want to compile PF torch from source. There is a general idea and uh, general steps which which I follow generally. So you just get clone the repo. Let's say pf or tensorflow or torch dot git. After you have git cloned it, I just do git submodule, uh, you know, sync, which syncs the submodule to to a particular commit. Or uh, if you want to detach your head from a particular commit, or you can just do git submodule update in it recursive. This is very important because you know it updates your internal commits uh, in your internal subfolders, right? Now once if you have done that. Uh, you can just go ahead in, and do CD TensorFlow or PyTorch. And uh, the next thing which you can do is do two things. Python minus M, uh, you know, pip install minus R requirements.txt. If there is a requirements.txt. And if there is not a requirements.txt, then the straightforward step is running setup.py install. And if you do not have sudo access in your Linux kernel, just do it for a particular user. So that's that's it. So you are going to have a source compiled uh, libraries. Now most of these libraries which are there from on PyP 
uh, follow this particular principle. Uh, but um, you know, it, like there are separate other steps as well. Other separate steps. Uh, what is the spelling of separate? Uh, R A T E. Uh, steps for installing PF from Bizzle. So this is this is actually a bit complicated. You have actually to wget Bazel, you know, Bazel, Bazel build. Bazel is like the internal backend for TensorFlow. Um, actually, Bazel is the common backend for a lot of deep learning platforms. But for let's focus on TensorFlow as of now. So it is the C++ backend for you know TensorFlow. So whenever we are building TensorFlow, it is recommended to build from Bazel build. Okay, like if you are compiling Bazel from source. Uh, so that's you can get it online. You can just read documentations. You can get the exact syntaxes as well. Um, now this is just an out of kind of topic which I thought I should mention. Now once you these are the steps which you want to build your entire code. Now let's see into cmake.txt. I will give an example of a cmake.txt. Um, let's see home Let's go with the simplest one. There are very complex codes like YOLO as well, uh, but uh, which I just completed before. Um, CMake lists.txt, yeah. So this is the editor which I'm running on. It is mobile XTERM, right? It has the flexibility to you know open different editors. If you want to add, you know, open through VS code. Uh, if it is if it is not visible, I can open through VS Code as well. Um, so not sure if you are able to see. Let me. I, I don't know if I can zoom in over here, but let me try to zoom in. You know, in VS Code I can, but here, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, oh, yeah, it anyway, is visible, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah come on, zoom in. Why is it not zooming in? Yeah, uh, it is visible. Yeah. OK, is it visible, right? So great. So yeah, um, yeah so thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, whenever we write a CMake script, we need to have certain dependencies. So I'm going to open my notepad as well so that we can follow along while you are writing. Just OK. CMake, how do you write a CMake file? Okay. So CMake uh, is first you need the CMake version. What minimum version of CMake that you want? All right. So uh, you generally write this by CMake minimum required version. Now this is very important. This should be there across. You know, this should be there across your CMake. Uh, any kind of files that you build. Now version 3.0 fatal is the default that uh, Torch uses. You can change it. Uh, to 3.1, 3.2, but do not go below that. Why? Because this version dependent on LipTorch. So if you're installing the latest version of LipTorch, uh, make sure to check the binaries are compatible with CMake, you know, the version that you're typing, if you're, if you're going for an older version of CMake. Okay? And so the first step is to define your CMake. So let me write it as one. Define CMake version. Okay. The next step is to uh, what is the next step? The next step is to define your project name. In my case, let's say it is ResNet uh, MNI ST Linear, for example. Okay. A simple project name. Just yeah. And the third step is to define your packages. This is where it gets interesting. Uh, here I have only, I only require, uh, you know, torch. So this particular line, find packages torch required, this signifies that while running your C CMake, you should have torch installed. You should have torch compiled, actually, not installed, compiled. So you should have the C++ backend of torch compiled. So which is generally done when you do a pip install. So no need to worry about that. So find package. So this is torch. OK, so uh, required. So if, if you want to have some other package, let's say Apex, NVIDIA Apex. Uh, so you're going, to, you're going to write find package Apex installed. If you are going to have something like, let's say, you know, find package OpenCV. 
I'm guessing it's OpenCV only. Uh, OpenCV installed like that. Okay, so if you want to have, let's say, um, TensorFlow, so find package TensorFlow required. Okay, so define your packages. And the next step is to set your flags. Set your flags. Set your flag. Set while setting your flags. It means that that uh, you know uh, there are different versions of C plus plus. I'm I'm sure that many of you know that we have C plus uh, plus 11, 14, 16, 17. Uh, right. There are certain you know changes uh, which are there in the libraries. Uh, so we have to actually specify uh, you know the flags which are there for C plus plus. Right. They are compatible with with Torch Lib Torch version. Okay, so this particular line, CMake CXX flags uh, are compatible with the Torch CXX flags. So this set command, uh, you know, sets the CXX flags to the LibTorch CXX flags. Until now, so uh, so what have we learned till now? We have learned about CMake lists. CMake list, the first idea is to define the CMake version, you know, uh, to, to define my project name, you know, finding the required packages that I want to be compiled and setting the flags of my C++ compiler. The next important thing is, forget this as of now, 8 to 18, don't require this as of now. The next thing is add executables. Add executables as the name suggests. You are going to out whenever you write a C file, you are going to get a dot O in GCC or G compiler. So that signifies that it is a you know uh, it, it is a let's say output binary, right? So um, you are going to have you are going to specify what is your going to be an output binary. Output binary, all right. And the next step is to link your binaries. This is very interesting. You have to link your project binaries to your torch binaries. Project binaries to torch binaries. Why is this required? You have already created your executables, right? But torch does not know that the executable is present there. LibTorch does not know that the executable is present there. So you want to link, you have to link your project dependencies, right, to your uh, torch dependency, lip torch dependencies, or your binaries. And last one is setting your, you know, by property, I mean, like, uh, let's say, uh, there is, so let's say you're compiling with C++ 11, but your target value is C++ 17. All right. So in that case, you can you can set your property as, you know, what it will do, what the LibTorch will do is that internally, if you have written some code which is compatible with C11 but not compatible with 17, it is going to make that changes itself in the back. So you are going to get some warnings while compiling the you know uh, CMake, you are going to get certain warnings that this is deprecated, this is deprecated. But you know, uh, uh, but that that will automatically happen. So it is telling you that you can update your code to C uh, C17, but it's, it's not. Uh, you have written it for 11. So that is why you set your property to certain CXX. So generally, I've, it, it is kept as standard as 14, C++ 14. Uh, that's it. You do not need 27 to 34 because 27 to 34 is required for Windows systems. Uh, so if you want to build, um, you need to have, let's say if you want to build for Windows, you want to build with CMake for Windows. This is all for Linux. So I forgot to mention very sorry about that. I forgot to mention all of these that I have written is for Unix bindings or Linux bindings. Right. They are the same across Linux and Unix. So you won't be having a problem across Unix devices or Linux devices. But you are going to have a problem if you compile this straight from your Windows system. Because Windows, are, Windows is different. Uh, I'm sure uh, most of you know that. So here you need for Windows, you need a VS a Visual Studio not Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio, with proper C++ binaries installed, which is a very hefty process, very long and tiring process. Okay, And then, you know, you're going to write this part of the code, which is already there, and you have to add these particular lines, if MS VC. So if Microsoft 
uh, visual uh, i'm not sure what msvc means but visual core or something not sure but uh, they are going to again compile these dlls because windows is windows has dlls so they are going to compile the torch binaries that we have written that we have just set till over here linking post that they are going to build the dlls for you only then you can run it in your windows system okay so it is a little bit different um, but in a nutshell these these seven steps are all that you need actually these seven steps are all that you need anything that you find uh, sorry i'm just anything that you find which is uh, you know uh, outside has are additional things like for example uh, i have written a code from 8 to 18 which is an option to download MNIST from the internet, right? So it will download and set in my current directory where I'm working on, where I have this CMake, okay? Got it. So this is how we build a CMake list. Clear? So these are seven steps that we require to build a CMake list. Now, once we have the CMake lists already built, uh, you have to write your actual code. So CMake is just an auxiliary code that you need for compiling binaries, but you need your restnet.cpp, your actual CPP code. Let's see mnist.cpp. Okay. Okay, this is a big, this is a very kind of, I, would, I, I am starting with a very, uh easier one so that you can understand this is this was actually a little bit big so yeah let's see resident.cp you can find most of these sources on github i have not i guess pushed some of them because they were still in the build state so yeah we'll be pushing that on the repo itself so no need to worry oh why am i copying this i can just open with vs code second it looks a little bit better in VS Code um, than in Vim or VI. Um, okay, so yeah, so now the main part of today, so writing the C++ backend for Torch so steps, and follow this very, very you know, uh, very attentively because it will help you in the long run. Uh, so first, as you write C++ code. I'm sure many of you write. I, I know that many of you are competitive coders, so you for the, you all this will be a you know cakewalk. So uh, first we do the includes. Uh, you know first we do whatever includes that we want. A very popular include that everyone does is bit slash stdc, just to have the STL. We please do not do that in deep learning uh, code <laughs> because it will include a lot of dependencies and we do not want that. So uh, first is torch. Uh, torch.h okay includes this is very important include the rest of the includes are just uh yeah you also need io stream otherwise you cannot get std uh, right so you need these two includes and after that you can you can go for any other torch uh, headers there are many torch headers like atpn pen so this is for tensor computation so if you're doing any kind of addition, subtraction between tensors, multiplication, so you need this. OK, uh, so after that, okay, it's 1745. I'm, I have to rush now. So uh, after that, you are going to create a kind of a module. So uh, if you have written torch code before in, in Python, you have you must have written, uh, you have must have seen something like nn.module. That is a Python translation of C++ code. But I'm going to use a torch inside the uh, you know namespace of torch. I'm going to use the NN module. Okay. Now there are certain ways to define your internal uh, blocks of your uh, neural network. So let's say this is a small net. Okay. So, so small net inside small net. What what are you going to have? You are going to create a simple linear layers. So how you create the steps are, you know, first you have to register the module. So let's say the module is a conf2d. So you have to register conf2d. That means you have to register. You have to use this register keyword, register module. So what this will uh, tell to the stack, tell to the stack that while creating, uh, you know, uh, a linear layer, you have allocated a certain certain bytes in the stack space. All right. 
So same thing, you know, I have three different layers. You can go on increasing as you want, right? Um, so my small net is just going to con contain register modules. Got it? So in my inside my constructor, so this is my default constructor. Now after that, what I'm going to have is I'm going to write something which is which returns a tensor. Always it returns a tensor. It, it is your forward method or your feed forward method. You can name it anything. You can name it, you know, you can name it IIT, go out. You can you can name it anything. So just for better understanding, you can just just name it forward. Uh, so and inside here you are going to have a tensor as X. Okay. Now once you do that, you have to write your operations. You have registered the module. That means you have allocated stack space for your linear layers. Now you have to you know uh, build the uh, what should I say uh, the layers actually. They have to write the actual layers. Uh, along with activations. So you are having a conf2d with, uh, let's say, linear layer with ReLU, linear layer with, you know, let's say, uh, TanH, linear layer with different kinds of things. Okay. So this is how we do this. Actually, this step is actually jumbled of two steps. First, we do a reshaping uh, because we are using MNIST, so we have to do kind of reshaping. So after we do the reshaping, we call the forward. So FFN1 forward means that it is calling the first linear module forward. Got it? So it is calling FFN1 forward. That's it. Now, if you want to apply any kind of activation on it, so just write it torch, uh, you know, just you can just write it as torch relu or torch tanh. That's it. So what it will do, it will apply the tanh activation on the forward outputs, on the forward pass outputs of your uh, feed forward network. Right? Same thing goes on. So these are just keywords. So you have dropout. You can mention your parameters. You have ReLU again, right? And if you want to have locked softmax, so I'm sure you know that softmax is just softmax. So uh, in C++, we get the log logits of the softmax values, right? And once if you have written that, once you have written the, you know, uh, the feed forward part, right? You can just write in, uh, you can just initialize your neural network. So I have initialized with null PTRs, which is quite common in uh, in C++. So um, you are going to initialize your, your stack space with null PTRs as of now. Also, you can initialize with Xavier initializers and all the good, good initializers that you know uh, while doing TensorFlow or PyTorch. You can do that as well. There are code samples which use Xavier and uh, others. I think bottleneck transformer uses Xavier. So uh, you are going to see that in that C++ code if you go. So um, after that, you are, once you have built this, this is actually your neural network being built. So you have, uh, you have actually built your module, okay? Now, in your main function, you can write your training loop, right? You can write your training loop. So if you write your training loop, um, since we are using the MNIST data, we need the data loader, right? Torch uses a data loader part. So we need to load the data from a data loader perspective, right? So uh, so this is how it does. Generally, this is the syntax of creating a multi-threaded data loader, okay? And this is very important, Torch data transform stack. And I'm sure you understand that this, it creates a stacked branch of 64, 64 uh, batch size stacked images, right? O on top of each other, not images, but these are tensors on top of each other, okay? You specify your torch optimizers, torch.optim that we use in Python. Uh, same thing over here. We're using the namespace in atom optimizers over here. Um, and then you write the training loop, which is a simple for loop, right? You write a simple for loop and uh, for the number of epochs that you want to have, and you batch off the gradients, uh, batch off the data from, uh, from the input samples from the data loader. You know, you are taking the, just like we do in normal C++, we are just taking the index of it since it is a pointer. and um, the next step is very important, and I wanted to highlight, highlight this for training. Okay, the next step is very important. If you are doing forward pass only, always use with uh, torch dot nograd in Python. Very important thing for optimization. This small trick will save you many milliseconds. Okay, if you are just doing forward pass, if and if you if you if you do not want backward pass, okay, uh, or um, so just a small trick which I which I just told you. Uh, yeah, uh, optimizer.0grad. Optimizer.0grad means that 
whenever you are computing the back backward propagation, let's say up till the first node, you are doing the derivatives. What it will do in the next iteration, it will always start from zero. It will not allocate any previous uh, gradients which it collected in the before step. So let's say i minus one epoch, it will, you know, let's say the ith epoch will not have any dependency on the i minus one epoch. This is known as torch dot zero grad. That means you are flushing out the gradients at each backprop at the end of each backprop step. Okay. Then what happens that uh, then the next step is inside the training, uh, uh, let's say for loop, we are going to feed forward it. You see net dot feed forward. We are passing in the data over here. Okay. The data loader, which is, which is the data uh, over here, the batch data, right? And this is the loss that you, you know, you know torch dot forward. I'm just writing it as forward so that you understand torch dot NNL loss. NLL loss means nothing but a cross entropy loss. Okay, so the general cross entropy loss that you write in PyTorch, it is the same thing. Um, and then loss dot backward is just the same thing as in Python. Uh, and optimizer dot step is to update the optimizer states. It's also the same in, in Python as well. And that's it. The rest of these are just print statements. So this is what a, a general simple code of building a PyTorch based, a C++ based uh, neural model looks like. So define your model, call the register modules to allocate stack space, create the feed forward uh, logic. That means actual build neural network that you want, including activations. And just allocate, uh, you can just allocate it using nulls for the time being, or you can just initialize with some other values and it, it goes on, right? And this is the training loop. Now, since in the interest of time, uh, I'm gonna show you You can you can go through other examples as well. So uh, let's say this one. I hope you understood what I'm trying to say. I I know that this is a very large topic and I have lots of things which I wanted to tell, but you know uh, may not be able to. So yeah. So this is a convolutional kind of network which uh, which uses conf 2D and linear layers uh, for MNIST as well. So. Um, and while running, yeah, most important thing, I want to show you the running steps as well. Let me just go over here. So let me just go back to MNIST. Linear MNIST. Okay. And uh, the command is, I have already built the command. So, so I'm just going to, you know, if I have any changes, uh, I forgot the command. Uh, where was the command in, in my code editor? Yeah, build config release. I keep on forgetting this command, even though I've used it so many times. Yeah, so you are going to see something like this. So 50% uh, build, 60% build, 70% build, 100% build like that. Okay, so, uh, and if you want to compile it from, let's say if you want to build it again, uh, see make this here, it is always, important to just see see my directory structure you need to have your in, in the initial stage you need to have two files cmake lists and your uh, cpp file okay and if you have any other dependencies let's say i have download mnist.py dependency over here so you need three three files at the start these files cmake install cmake make file cache uh, so these files will be will be you will get after you type this command this uh, this one, C make DC uh, DC make prefix path. Uh, why is it not picking up the previous command? It's very bad. So over here, it is very important to mention your absolute path. So over here, my absolute path is. Right, this is my absolute path, and it will build the binaries for you, and in the same time it will download the MNIST dataset for you. Okay, so in the GitHub repo I have given only these two files, these three files for you: CMake list, download MNIST, and the CPP file. Now just take these three files, put in a, put in a particular directory in your home directory, right, and just run this command: DC make. Uh, of course, you have you must have installed libtorch, so just make this path. 
and uh, just after you make this part just do this build config right it will build uh, build config so it will show you like 50% 100% like that why is it taking so much time it should not take so much time but it generally completes quickly uh, so once you do that you just do dot slash uh, dot slash uh, what is my file name i think mnist linear dot cpp uh, why is it? Let me just see the files. Just one second. Can I make certain changes to the file? It should not help me. Okay, for the time being, let's me, let me show the bottleneck one only. Maybe I have edited something uh, just now while showing the demo. And yes, one thing is very important is that, uh, you know, One thing is very important is that uh, while writing the codes, if you get any kind of errors, the C++ compiler will show you uh, during the build stage. All right. So um, not sure, might have edited something, not sure uh, what happened. But the original running codes are there in GitHub, so don't worry on that. Uh, since I have short on time, I, I will not look into what is the error. Um, you can go through the bottleneck code as well. Uh, I ju I'm just giving you an idea so that you can understand it. I might take two, three more minutes extra if you have the time. So I just wanted to highlight certain things. Okay. So uh, same thing over here. You see torch 2 d conf 2 d options. So conf 2 d options is just like an, I would say, a parent class for writing a conf 2 d uh, Okay. So if you go to the blocks, you can see that register module is there. I just wanted to show the similarity of the code so that you can get an idea. So you create a constructor. Right inside the constructor, you have the register modules. Okay. Once you have the register modules, you create the forward function, which is actually the logic for your feed forward layers. Right. And once you have that, you can, uh, that's it. You can allocate, you know, if you have NN allocate, you can allocate this conf1 as null PTR, BN1 as null PTR. You can do that. You cannot do that. It's up to you. All right. So go through this. It is just the code for bottleneck transform, uh, bottleneck uh, ResNet. That's dual network. So uh, it is just the, uh, you know, I, I had not written the, I had not added the training script over here, like you saw, like with gradient descent, SGD or atom optimizer, NNL loss. So I had not written that. You can add that as well. It will be an exercise for you guys as well, so that you can actually train bottleneck. Uh, yeah, just go through these. And um, another thing I wanted to highlight was uh, we saw about a lip torch. Now, why is that very much important is because LibTorch actually scales up very fast. If you compare the time for uh, for Torch and LibTorch, you know you will find that the C++ inference is quite you know inference as well as the training is quite uh, is, is quite you know fast. So you are going to have a very rapid kind of training. Uh, but in the case of uh, there are other things as well, known as Torch script. Okay, Torch script means you write your code in Torch in PyTorch. Right, and you export that to C. You write your code in Torch and you export that to C. Let me show you. So, this is another way. This is there in the uh, Torch script directory, uh, not the directory, the branch. Uh, so, the ResNet 50 model is this one very basic ResNet 50 model. You can you can find it from this is the standard template for ResNet 50 in uh, in um, uh, in uh, in Torch already given to you, so you can just use it. Yeah. So the command for tracing a model is known as torch.jit.trace, and if you want to save that traced traced module, you can you can do that as well. Now, why is it important? Because uh, when you compare uh, the Python runtimes for traced model and untraced model, you are going to get a difference. That difference is over here. You can also refer to this script, uh, torch GIT tracing of BERT, BERT large actually. It is a transformer model. So you can see I had done an estimation of the performance uh, of the different uh, with trace on CPU and GPU uh, as for BERT large and without trace, that is the native BERT model. Okay, so you can see that for 100 iterations, you will be finding a significant time gap in the, in the the during the inference stage. 
All right. So that is why traced model in, in Python is quite faster than the uh, you know original model. And the reason why it is faster is because I do not want to go into the exact details, but always remember that branching happens at a very low depth. Now I'm going to give you to understand what, what this line particularly means. You have a ternary tree. If you do not branch the tree up till, let's say, sixth level of depth, uh, versus if you branch it from the first level, which will have a greater O of n, right? If you branch a particular tree, let's say, for example, a binary tree, right? A BST, for example, uh, you know, let's say an incomplete BST where you have a skewed BST at the top and let's say it goes on skewed and at the end terminal you have certain leaves branching as opposed to a complete binary tree. Now you may argue that login operations are happening, all of the operations, what you want to do, sign, find, search and all, it will be n times of log of n. But there is something called as amortized cost, which is a little bit lower, right? So I'm not sure if you, if you know all these, but uh, this is, this is just the idea. So go through it. Always remember that traced models are faster for a larger time span. Let's say for 1,000 iterations, 2,000 iterations, 3,000 iterations. Okay, it will be a larger uh, time span. You know, and I have this traced BERT and traced GP, uh, you know, uh, not GPT, uh, ResNet available. So if you want to, uh, if you want to run a traced model, so just let me write the steps so that you can follow easily while you are running this. 18.3, very sorry for the overtime. You know, uh, this, these are the two main topics which I wanted to highlight. Uh, so uh, this is my PyTorch model, which is traced, which is the code which I saw, which I just showed you. You have this CMake lists, just like before. Same thing, you just compare it, it's just same thing. Just the names are changed for the files. Now it will be very easy for you to understand. I have kept the code as same as possible. And uh, after that, there is jit.cpp. Now, this is a very small piece of code. So here, what you're doing uh, in the int main, right? Here I've loaded, you can see that attend module. Attend module is for tensor calculations, tot script. Script module is required for any kind of tot script model, right? First check whether the uh, C++ model, sorry, tot script model, not the C++ model, is uh, is is uh, correct. Correct means that it should not have any errors while loading torch ship JIT. Uh, it should not have any errors. So this is important when you when you already have a pre-trained model, let's say BERT or GPT, and you want to export that to C++, and you want to do anything with that C++ model. Let's say again, you want to do fine tuning on C++. You want to do just inference on C++. In that case, it is very important. Right. So, yeah. And, uh, you know, just try to load the module if it is not there, you know, while running it, it is very simple. I want to show the running as well. You know, this is, you, you can feed in the inputs, which is a tensor in set of tensor inputs. In the case of ResNet kind of models, this is the dimensions that is generally followed. Um, and we just get the outputs to check, you know, the predicted values. Now for running that, a little bit different. I'm, I'm just taking a few moments of your time. Very sorry for that, but I wanted to show you. Uh, where is the torch? So oh, let me just write it in this screen. Uh, cd dot dot cd dot resnet. Come on. Yeah. So now, if you are, so what is the file name? Let me just see. So the file name C is torch resnet jit. CPP. So now it is a little bit different because you also have to specify the path to the model. So torch resnet uh, jit dot cpp and next should be the path to your model. So this is in my same directory. So I can just write it as traced resnet 50 model dot pp. Right? Uh, why is it the batch permission denied? One second. Uh, CH mod 777. 
this is some, this is sometimes an issue because if you have two different uh, kernels open not sure why it is happening this but let me show you i should have the previous runs as well uh, i should have the previous runs when you run this it should be correct there sh there should not be any issue uh, but it will show you like uh, your model is okay. Yeah, this is the output. So if you see uh, over here, let me just uh, highlight. Okay, where did it go? Uh, where did it go? Not sure why is it why is it not working as of now? But Yeah, this is what this is the one. Torch, ResNet Jet, traced, ResNet model 50. And you are going to get the outputs, whatever inputs that you have provided. And you are going to get the time taken for inference as well. Okay, so you can do this with BERT as well. So I did not get time to write for BERT, but uh, you can do it for mobile net and efficient net as well. So I think that's the majority of the things that I wanted to talk about, right? So I know that there may be a lot of questions. Uh, so uh, I'm going to stop here and give some time for questions if you have any. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, yeah. Yeah, sure. Continue. Continue. Yeah, you can continue. Okay. 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 Yeah. So. Uh, so just one thing I wanted to highlight is um, there are certain, there are different things what is happening in the kernel level when we write a particular code, okay? So um, NVIDIA has a set of different libraries for optimizing very large workloads. And these workloads are based upon, and sorry, and these optimizations are based upon the instruction sets of your GPU graphics card or your CPU card, okay? So uh, most of these instruction sets are SIMD in nature. I, I will ask you to you know, know what is SIMD, okay? So SIMD in nature generally means that these, are, these do not have a uniform memory access when you are collecting information from your GPU to your CPU, okay? And you are actually transferring the information from your CPU to GPU. Whenever you say you are offloading to CUDA, let me show you an example. Two kinds of things are happening. One is data parallelism, one is model parallelism. Okay. No one will ask you these questions in interview, but you should know. Well, if you if you go into ML space, it, you should know. Do not blindly just run on CUDA zero or something like that. So model parallelism means that you break part of the model into separate GPU cards. Okay. GPU cards have tiles internally. Okay, so let's say one GPU card has two tiles. So four GPU cards will have four into two, eight tiles. Simple calculation, right? So you can spread your model across eight tiles, six tiles, four tiles, and so on. Okay, so this is how generally we, we offload our uh, offload our workloads. Now, uh, when we come to uh, this is known as model parallelism. You are segregating the model. You are you are partitioning a part of let's say sequential model one. Uh, let me show you an example over here. Um, um, yeah. Where did you go? Yeah. So you can load sequential model one to CUDA zero. If you have other devices, since Colab does not have more than one GPU kernels, and I wanted to show it on Colab only because uh, you can use this code for, for your own, if you have NVIDIA GPUs in your local. Um, if you have sequence two, Sequential 2, you can load it to CUDA 1. So there are also ways to set up the tiles, but that is very fine level. We have to write certain shell scripts for that, but as of now, not required. So you can specify CUDA 1. You can, let's say sequential 3 or feed forward 3, you can specify to CUDA 2 if you have the CUDA uh, GPUs available. Now, as far as I know, this collab runs on 300 Volta. So they are going to partition the model into separate blocks. 
So instead of running sequential one, sequential two, and the, let's say forward in CUDA zero, I'm going to run sequential one in CUDA zero to sequential two in CUDA one and FC uh, feed forward in, in CUDA two. So this is known as model parallelism. Uh, there are disadvantages of model parallelism. What is the major disadvantage? While back propagation, while back propagation, while you are updating the weights across the three different shards, you are going to have, you need to have a proper synchronous mode. You need to have a proper synchronization because what happens, let's say CPU is your master, right? CPU is your master. You need, CPU is accountable for everything. He is the one which offloads it to the GPUs, right? So GPU one CUDA zero is let's say servicing uh, at a very high rate. His RAM is, you know, let's say his flops are increasing. Flops means the number of computations per second. So let's say his flops are quite high. Uh, CUDA one is at flops are quite low and CUDA three is flops are quite, let's say intermediate. Let's say 10, 5, and uh, 2, for example, or 7, for example. So what will happen? There are certain uh, communication algorithms, communication algorithms which are known as message passing. Uh, there is a popular library called as MPI4PY, message passing interface. Message passing interface, it is also a popular concept in uh, you know, OS. So message passing means that if these modes are asynchronous, then the CPU will collect it from, let's say, uh, you know, CUDA 3, CUDA 2, if it comes earlier, then it will collect it from CUDA 1, okay? So uh, these methods, once we get the gradients, once we get the gradients, updated gradients from uh, all the three different GPUs, something happens. So the CPU's, uh, CPU is responsible for, for actually performing all the reduction operations. Reduction operation means, let's say uh, you have a gradient, you want to do derivatives. So you do the reduction. So dy dx, if you come, you know, do the simple gradients, you want to do certain reductions. So those reductions are happening inside the CPU after all the weights have been, you know, taken up by the CPU. Okay. So the GPU sends one at a time asynchronously. Okay. So there are different algorithms for scheduling those. All reduce, all gather. Okay. So there, I did not get, uh, you know, those are very detailed and I have not prepared code bases for that. But if time permits, you know, I will add this to uh, this module as well. Um, you know, these are, that, that's an entire world of things which is happening. Well, like inter-process communication, inter-thread communication between the CPUs and the GPUs, as well as inter-threads communication between the GPU tiles while computing. Okay, so these are very important. Okay, so uh, this is just the idea. Always remember that when you are offloading it to model parallelism mode, there is always an overhead on model communication, like GPU to CPU communication, I.O. And this is actually present over here. If you see the, you know, things over here, you can see that this is a little bit higher than the single GPU. Even if, if you go over here to GPU SCUDA 1 and CUDA 2, you will find that the time is a little bit lower. But let me assure you, you know, the IO calls will be quite high so that it, it actually does not do anything. Okay, so you are almost getting the same level of efficiency. So always remember that, uh, you know, passing, message passing through like GPU to CUDA, GPU to CPU, host to device. So these are very time consuming processes. All right. Now, if you have very good NVIDIA, like A100s with NVLink, good, excellent. You are going to get a very good kind of byte stream transport between the CPU and the GPU. That is why these benchmarks are there, right? NVIDIA has tuned, you know, Megatron large model with, you know, 350 billion parameters, let's say, one round of inference, 30, you know, 0.13 seconds, milliseconds, something like that. So this is quite, this is, this can only be done if you have a very strong bandwidth between your CPU and the GPU, right? So that is model parallelism. Data parallelism means keep the model at one place and slice off the data across the GPUs. So let's say you have a batch of data of 10. So you slice off two, two, two across GPUs. Okay. And then combine the results. Now, if you combine both of them together, model plus data parallel, you are going to get a very good speed. There are disadvantages of data parallelism, data parallelism as well. Data parallelism suffers from RAM, high RAM usage. Okay. So that's it. That's what I wanted to mention. And you can see, you know, uh, over here, the charts speak otherwise, because here in Colab, we have only one CUDA device. So that's it. So that is why I could not, uh, you know, show you the actual differences. Um, yeah, and uh, that's it. Always remember that you know many things are happening at the back end when you write a particular code. So, um, yeah, and uh, always try to read on stuff and learn on stuff.
So that's it. I do not want to take much of your time. It's 6.15, 16 already. Uh, I'm going to update the README with a proper README and uh, I'm going to add more in details. You won't, so let me tell you something. There has been uh, something called as, uh, from what I know, Deep Speed. Deep Speed is a Microsoft optimization for training extra large models. Okay. The Deep Speed Transformer was written for in C++. That C++ is compatible with CUDA, but it is not compatible with other hardwares. So let's say AMD CPUs uh, or uh, let's say any other any other kind of excuse. It is not compatible. So yeah, so lots of things are happening, you know, in, the, in this space. And I hope you like and learn something from it. If you learned even 5%, you know, I would be more than happy <laughs> because I generally do not take these sessions, but I thought that you were a bright bunch. So, you know, I thought, why not uh, give them this, uh, give them this, uh, you know, session. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's all from that side. Thank you, Mr. Avlas, sir. Uh, it was a great session and very insightful. Um, so like uh, we have a few doubts here um sure 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 so um one of them this is like so at yeah. what point of the workload level do we start using c++ frameworks like uh, right now at our level we use python most of the times yeah and generally that that is what you will find in most of the uh, uh, most of the code bases as well as in the industry as well most of them have, have written, you know, PyTorch, uh, sorry, not PyTorch, you know, you know uh, let's say either in Torch or TensorFlow for Python. But when you are working on uh, even a very small model, let's say by small model, I mean, let's say, for example, mobile net or efficient net. Okay. So these or even yellow or even yellow or dark net. So these are actually written in C++. So porting is not an issue. The second important thing is you are going to get way faster inference as compared to the Python approach, way faster. Okay, so these benchmarks that you see, you know, uh, that many organizations have created, these are all on C++, these are not on Py uh, Python. Creating that much of efficiency, yes, yes, there is actually one way to create efficiency on Python as well. You need to rewrite your wrappers using many extensions. Scython, uh, if you have uh, CUDA drivers, PyCUDA, uh, you know, if you want to have support from ONNX, you have ONNX runtime. So I was working on this script on ONNX runtime, TensorRT2 ONNX and vice versa for PyTorch models. So you can, it is there in my GitHub, but I did not get a chance to test it. You can, but this code is, is working because I had previously tested it with TensorFlow. So it should work with uh, Torch as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is, this is the idea. So, uh, but for very large models, let's say if you're fine tuning BERT, if you're fine tuning um uh, BART or the larger models like T5, 11 billion models. Uh, so in that case, it is better to switch to if you have time, right? Rewriting inference code in C is tedious. You need to account for compile errors because you know I, I think you all know what C is. So yeah. you need to account for compile errors and everything. So uh, and it is it takes a lot of time consuming. Most of the businesses do not have that much time. They want production ready code. And if you want to have production ready code, uh, the best way is to uh, is to select the best known configuration or BKCs as we want, as we call it for the particular platform and libraries. Let's say you are optimizing for Intel CPUs, Xeon AVX2. If you are optimizing for CUDA drivers, like CUDA 11.6, CUDA, you know, these kinds of drivers. In that case, separate, uh, you know, quantization, separate things are done. So I wanted to actually mention quantization as well, but uh, I, I was not able to create the, you know, um, I did not get the time actually. So I just created uh, had I known two weeks back, I would have created a lot more resources for you to understand. So no worries, I will add, you know, all, all those details in the repo itself. Uh, but yeah, that is all in a nutshell. There is no actual level, but when you want to have very fine-tuned performance, uh, it is better to go with uh, with C++. I think so, from my personal perspective, yeah. Yeah. Um, one more we have. So like, uh, is there any other resource to set up LipTorch? Cuda. So, uh, as far as I know, this LipTorch is compatible with NVIDIA CUDA. Uh, this, so whatever you 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 execute this, if you have Linux, 
system with CUDA driver NVCC. If you do NVCC minus version, if you get a valid uh, CUDA driver, in that case, if you do WGET on this uh, on this slip torch, it should work. There should not be any issue because the slip torch is a cross-platform uh, binary, so you should not face any issue as such. Okay. Um. So, like in the start, you talked about graph structure in TensorFlow yeah. and PyTorch. So, yeah. So, uh, oh God, where do I start? So, uh, yeah. So, whenever we write Torch code, actually, Torch code is a little bit more optimized than TensorFlow. The reason why I did not write in TensorFlow because uh, I know its drawbacks. There are something lagging in TensorFlow. So. I wanted to go ahead with Torch today. So Torch has this beautiful, just like I told you, the fusion process. The fusion process which Torch has for different uh, operations. Let's say you want to fuse two kernels. One of the kernel is conf2d. Other kernel is relu. So conf, just like I had written right in one of the examples, relu inside that ffn1 slash feed forward conf, whatever there is. So Torch internally fuses those submodules together in a very better way. By better way, I mean that whenever you are analyzing images, there is certain format. The format is generally either NHCW or NHWC or NCHW, right? So Torch internally does this C that you see the channels at the end. So it is generally NHWC, okay? And this is actually very fast. Most of the super speed compilers DPC++, 1MKL, all of these compilers always support C at the back end, channels last at the back end. Why? Because it helps the convolution kernels to speed up very fast rather than channels intermediate. So yeah, so that is one of the advantages which Torch has. It has already, you know, implicit conversion of, uh, implicit conversion to channels last. A TensorFlow, we manually do that. Uh, there are other changes as well like the memory that is taking up in a TensorFlow runtime and in a Torch runtime, deallocation of certain memories. In TensorFlow, while you will find a lot of, I would say, config parameters already present while doing the gradient tape. Uh, in Torch gradient tape, uh, there is no gradient tape in Torch, very sorry. When Torch, when we're computing the loss, uh, you can optionally set or exclude certain tensors which are not of the data type of Torch.tensor from your XPU from your uh, CUDA device or your uh, CPU device. So you have that flexibility. So these are certain you know, advantages and, and disadvantages. There are a lot more, but uh, go with either one. If you are just starting to learn and if you're just using, go either one. TensorFlow is great. I only contribute to TensorFlow the, because it has a lot of you know, still pending changes, yeah. Um, so like a general question, like people usually have like, how do they like get started in this deep learning career? Like. Some people have questions like, uh, do we have to need to have research background uh, or something like that? Yeah. So like in yeah. your, like you are very experienced in deep learning stuff and you have, so like they were asking about how to get started in that career. So uh, one of the most important things I want to highlight is you should be good in data structures. That is the de facto rule across industries irrespective of what thing that you're working on, right? So uh, you may not be necessarily good in algorithms. Like I'm not a competitive coder, right? Um, I do not do competitive coding, but I can write, you know, data structures. So I know my ways around certain compilers. Um, and you should have, apart not only data structures, you should have a good sound knowledge of how operating system works, operating system and at a hardware level. Uh, because deep learning is not, you know, you know, nowadays there are so many libraries like uh, Hugging Face has those beautiful optimizations, uh, you know, OpenCV, um, whatnot, right? Torch TensorFlow is already there, MXNet, JAX, Sonnet, whatever. Yeah. So, so many libraries are there, but um, it is very important to know that when you see the code, right, thousand lines of code they have written, uh, try to focus on certain lines which are of important, which you find that, yeah, this is actually replicating to this and start investing in open source if you have time. Yes, of course, data structures and, you know, that is that should be the core, you know, idea, but also try some time to just see what issues are rising and see if you can reproduce that issue in a popular deep learning library or, you know, in a, in a popular, let's say in Hugging Face Transformers, 
let's say you are facing an issue, just raise that issue and see what others are commenting and how you can solve that. Or just check up the similar issues which are there. So this actually speeds up a lot of a lot of things. Um, I, I will tell you the hardest thing is actually writing code. Writing code is very difficult, right? Replicating a pop, you know a research paper to code is very and actually reproducing the benchmarks if the code is not open sourced is very difficult, right? And uh, yeah, I would say that once you have a bit of a knowledge, like for example, all deep learning systems. I will give you an idea. All deep learning systems platforms use pipe pipe communication all right pipe mm -hmm. communication and mpi on message passing internally you know there is the hardware support for that but they all do this so why don't i look into that you know there are so many uh, collections collections of uh, repositories you know books resources uh, and there have been so many contributions on uh, tpu tensorflow for tpu and all mm -hmm. those things now what I'm worried is that uh, if I do not know the code, how TPU clustering works, I, I can write the code, right? I can, uh, you know, with strategy scope and I can write the scope. That that is not an issue. But I should know, like, what is this? What is this thing? What is this clustering in TPU? How do I cluster across different shards in TPU? How it is different from a GPU clustering? So this kind of things, you if you just go into depth, you know, you can have, you can go on increasing. It is just a world in its own, but. Uh, you should have a superficial knowledge of all of those things. But just like I said, breaking into research is a little bit difficult. Uh, I am from India and, uh, um, you know, just like an engineering student like yourself uh, from NITs. And uh, just, uh, I would say that, you know, be good on, uh, do justice to your courses that, that you are taught. Particularly don't, at the, at the, you know, at the expense of data structures and algorithms, don't leave out other core architectures like computer architecture or, you know, uh, let's say operating systems. Uh, these are very, very important for, for, for anything, actually. So, yeah, I, I would say that. Now, uh, the other thing to break into research is try to implement research papers yourself as much as you can. Of course, take help from official repos. Try to create your own versions. Find collaborations, like collaborators. Reach out to university heads. Reach out to um, organizations, organizational heads. Like, do you want to do a collaborative research with this university, XYZ University? I know people from there. They are working on this topic, which may be of importance to us. And just try to do, uh, you know, just try to work on that. Apart from your day job, if you have a job, uh, like if you are working currently, and if you even if, if you are a student, it's the you know it's the only time of your career where you are going to get the ample amount of time. Believe me, once you get in the industry, there will be so much of workload. And of course, you have Saturday, Sundays. You do not want to waste. <laughs> so you will have so much of workloads. But yeah, just uh, this is the best time that you have if you are an engineering grad. So that is all that I can say. You know, that's that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Well, thank you, sir. So. Um... Yeah. Uh, before ending the session, I would just like to talk a little bit about little bit about our club and the work we do. Yep. So, so our club at Consulting and Analytics Club. So we aim to help students start a successful career in management consulting and data analytics. So uh, we organize a few courses and events throughout the year uh, with support. So uh, one of these initiatives is Summer Analytics, so which is a free bootcamp course on data science and machine learning. So it has catered to about 25,000 students over the past five years, uh, helping aspirants understand core concepts and uh, different aspects of supervised, unsupervised machine learning and introduce, introducing them to the latest tools and algorithms in the industry. So as part of this course, we provide learning materials, course conduct assignments, hackathons, and as well as webinars like this. So anyone who would like to check out the course material can do so by clicking on the link mentioned in the description so yeah that was it thank you sir thank you thank you and take care you know take care to everyone yeah, thank you everyone you know, not to interact uh, with everyone but thank you thank you lovely lovely mm -hmm. session bye see you take thank care. you sir